Welcome to the Tech Talks by Microsoft EMEA. My name is Manfred Telber. I'm a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional in the category Cloud and Data Center. And today we are talking about Azure Stack HCI networking. So we have several topics about the um, Azure Stack HCI operating system and the networking requirements in special. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat on the platform you are watching this live stream. So LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, whatever you want to use to send in your questions or comments. We already had several tech talks where we um, yeah, had the topic Azure Stack HCI. And if you attended these tech talks, you should already be familiar with the architecture of Azure Stack HCI. Azure Stack HCI is an operating system that runs on premises on our physical server hardware. Azure Stack HCI uses the local drives in the servers to provide a software-defined storage based on the Storage Spaces Direct technology. So we use the local drives of the servers. This can be hard disks in combination with flash drives. This can be hard disk, uh, sorry, flash only configurations. Um, this can be three-tier configurations with hard disk SSD and NVMe, so different configurations are possible. The advantage is that this hyperconverged infrastructure uses an active, active configuration. So every server is active in this configuration. We can start with one server, a dual server configuration is possible. Here we see a configuration with three servers. When we write any data to this Azure Stack HCI cluster environment in a three node configuration, we have a three way mirroring. So we have one copy here, another copy here, and the third copy on the server number three here on the right hand side. This means um, we have to distribute the data across the servers. The data is distributed based on extends or slabs. These extends have a size of 256 megabytes. And the data is distributed synchronous. There's no asynchronous action here. It's distributed synchronous, real time, via the local network. And this is the reason why we have some requirements to the local network interfaces. So typically, we have minimum to 10 gigabit interfaces. So now the question is, is this enough or what is the bottleneck in such a configuration? If we have two NVMEs in each server, and this is possible, here we can see NVMEs. Sorry, let's start with SSDs, solid state disks that are connected via serial ATA or SAS interface. If we have two serial ATA SSDs in each server, and two 10 gigabit interfaces would be fine because the bottleneck would be the SSD. If we have two NVMEs here, like we can see here, the bottleneck would be the two 10 gigabit network interface ports. So in such a configuration, it would be recommended to have two 25 gigabit ports or 200 gigabit ports. Here in this configuration, two 25 gigabit ports, so roundabout would be five. So you have to ensure that you don't build a bottleneck on the storage side or on the network side or the CPU side. So the components have to be um, yeah, um, optimized to each other. So the great thing is that network is not our limiting, limiting factor because when we look at network interfaces from today, 10 gigabits is, let's say state of the art, 25 gigabits is very cheap available. 100 gigabit per port speed, port speed is also brought available in the market from different uh, vendors. Um, 200 and 400 gigabit port speed is already in testing and will be available in the future. So network will not be our limitation regarding the available technology. It's only maybe our limitation based on what you select for your specific configuration. 
So what are the network requirements for Azure Stack HCI? When we look in detail at the network requirements, Microsoft writes in the docs or in the learn platform, you know that the docs articles now are all available via learn.microsoft.com, but the previous URLs still work. For a small implementation, Microsoft says 10 gigabit network interfaces are fine. We should always have two or more interfaces for redundancy and performance. For high performance configurations, um, so four or more deployments or flash only configurations, Microsoft recommends 25 gigabits or more network interface port speed. And Microsoft recommends to have NICs that have RDMA enabled. Remote direct memory access should be enabled on these network interface cards. To be able to enable this functionality, you need specific network interface cards that provide the RDMA feature. What is RDMA? RDMA stands for Remote Direct Memory Access. And Remote Direct Memory Access avoids kernel copies. So it reduces the load on the CPU. This means we have lower latency, we have better throughput, and we have reduced CPU load. So great idea. How does this work? Um, the RDMA technology offloads storage a workload to the network interface card. To be able to offload something to a network interface card, we need a network interface card with a suitable um, central processing unit, a NIC processing unit on this card. Um, so now two different technologies are supported with Azure Stick HCI. iWarp is recommended. Rocky stands for RDMA over converged Ethernet is also possible. Why is iWarp recommended? Regarding the technical capabilities, both um, RDMA options, iWarp and RDMA, are on the same level from my point of view. So they are very similar regarding the possible throughput, regarding the capabilities and so on. But iWarp is easier regarding the configuration. So we have less requirements for a successful iWARP configuration than for a successful Rocky configuration. And this is the reason why Microsoft recommends iWARP. So please don't read here, iWARP is recommended because it's the better option. Um, iWARP is recommended because it's more robust, because we have less configuration options or tasks. If we configure everything correctly, Rocky is um, as good as iWarp is. So from my point of view, no difference here. But I've seen many Rocky implementations in the field where we have seen misconfigurations. And if you have a Rocky configuration where not everything is configured accordingly, then you will really run into trouble with this specific configuration here. So in uh, regarding the switches, both is possible to use switches or to run switchless. If we use switches, especially in a Rocky configuration, we need specific switches with specific requirements. I have some information about this on one of the next slides. With iWarp, we are very flexible. So let's talk a little bit more about this RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access. When we have a look on how the transaction works when we um, go or when we transfer data without um, RDMA, then we have the situation our CPUs on the source and on the target server are on high load because the um, traffic yeah, flow is via several layers on the source machine through several layers on the target machine. And all these layers have to be handled via kernel transaction 
from the central pro central processing unit. With the RDMA traffic, we have the situation that the data transfer bypasses the CPU. This means we don't have a hot CPU with high load. Here we can see this is the reason why blue colors are relatively cold CPU regarding the network load um, on the source and on the target system. We bypass the CPU. All the transactions are handled by the network interface card. We have a reduced amount of layers that have to be um, worked through on the source and the target system. And this means kernel copies are avoided. RDMA is a more direct traffic and it reduces the CPU load. It optimizes the usage of the CPUs in our systems. The available RDMA options are iWarp, I mentioned this, and they are Rocky and Rocky version two. So when we look at the certified RDMA adapters, if you attended the previous sessions about Azure Stack HCI, you know um, for an Azure Stack HCI implementation, you need a certified system, a certified solution, and certified Azure Stack HCI solution. And these solutions use network interface adapters from different vendors. Broadcom is a very familiar name. NVIDIA, previously Mellanox, Intel for sure you will know. Marvell was previously um, the uh, Cavium or Qlogic brand. There were several mergers. Why do I mention these brands here? It's a Microsoft webcast. These brands are important because some of these brands are Rocky focused and some of these brands are IVOP focused. So this means in this situation, it's not like when we talk about um, the CPUs, for example, where you say, okay, you can use a single socket machine, dual socket machine, depending on your preference. Here, it's really that with the decision for a specific brand, you decide for the workload um, IVOP or Rocky because Broadcom only supports Rocky traffic. So based on my knowledge from today, there's no IVORP capable adapter from Broadcom available. I mentioned Rocky works. If you configure everything accordingly, Rocky is fine, but the recommendation from Microsoft is to use IVORP. NVIDIA or Mellanox, I would assume this is the most known brand in Azure Stack HCI certified systems. Nearly every system has these network interface cards as an option. Um, but you have to know NVIDIA, previously Mellanox, is focused on Rocky. So if you decide for NVIDIA or Mellanox, you will have an Rocky-based configuration. But we are still at the point, Microsoft recommends IWOP. Broadcom and Mellanox, they don't offer IWOP capable cards. So what about the Intel? Intel E810 is a card that is available in a 10, 25, 50, and 100 gigabit port speed configuration. And this Intel E810 card supports IWOP. So on this list, if you want to follow the recommendation from Microsoft, then the first choice could be the Intel card. The Marvel QLogic here on this slide also supports IVORP, but you can see this is a single port card. So also IVORP supported, but compared to the Intel E810, a little bit limited regarding the possible speeds on one NIC because the maximum that's available on this card is a single 100 gigabit port. In the Intel uh, E810, we can have a, up to eight ports per network interface card. Um, so we have really high throughput that is possible here. So on the left-hand side, we have the Rocky cards here. 
On the right hand side, we have the IWAP cards and both IWAP cards have a big advantage. Both IWAP cards support a dual stack. So if you decide to use the Intel E810, you can also switch from IWARP to Rocky. So the card supports both um, options for the RDMA traffic. And so the Intel 810 is a relatively new network interface card. I'm not absolutely sure when it was announced, but I assume it was at the beginning of this year, so at the beginning of 2022. Um, and um, many Azure Stack HCI certified solutions already provide this card as an, as an uh, option because, as I mentioned several times, IWAP is the recommended configuration for Microsoft. So what are the requirements for IWARP? IWARP, we need an IWARP capable network interface card. There are many cards in the market that don't support Rocky and they don't support IWARP. So it's really an option. We have to ensure that it's on the card. We need an IWARP capable network interface card, for example, the Intel 810 card. We need the cabling, the IP address, a switch, or we have a direct attached configuration. So it's very easy. It's like you configure typically your network environments. When we think about Rocky, it's a little bit more complex because Rocky requires a looseless ethernet. When you think about your traditional network interfaces, about your traditional networks, we always have losable networks. This means we send data packages. And if a package is lost, the receiver will tell me, oh, package number 129 is missing. Please send this package again. And the sender will send this package again. When, you ha when we have a live stream like this here, we also have package loss. If the package loss is too high, you will have limited video or audio quality. Maybe you will see some artifacts on the video screen or you will have some outages in the voice because when we have a real time stream, it's not helpful if a missing package is delivered later because it doesn't help you to have some uh, voice pieces or video pieces later. This wouldn't make sense in a live video stream. This is the reason why all the streaming technologies I know in the market use some buffering technology. So for example, here on the platform we are using, you will see about 30 seconds later what I'm telling you here. So we have a delay of 30 seconds and this is the buffering. It's not a delay because the technique is not able to stream it live without a delay. This delay is only there to ensure that when I have reduced sending quality or we have some issues somewhere in the network that you will not see immediately these artifacts, but you will have a continuous data stream because we have this buffer of about 30 seconds that for sure will be reduced if we have some issues in the network, but it ensures that we have a smooth video stream. Um, when you are using Microsoft Teams, you can keep this in mind. There's a tool available at learn.microsoft.com for testing the network quality. And this is very interesting because if you are doing Teams calls on a regular basis, you usually will have good audio and video quality. And when you then look into this network quality monitoring tool, you will realize oh, I'm losing so many packages every uh, day because this is a typical action. If a switch is out of capacity, it drops packages and for sure these packages will be sent again. So these package drops increase if we have typically um, reached the load capabilities of our switches of our networks. So Rocky is looseless. But the question is, how can this be looseless? It can only be a looseless network if my sender knows from the receiver and the switch between if this um, speed of package delivery can be handled. So every component in the network needs an absolute 
clear information that the packages that are delivered by the Rocky capable cards and that include Rocky traffic have to be prioritized. So we have to ensure that these packages will be delivered and never be dropped. And if my receiver is not fast enough or my switch is at limited capacity or at the maximum load, these components will tell the sender, please reduce the performance. So Rocky does not mean that if I overload my system, that it always will run with the maximum performance. Rocky only ensures that the performance is yeah, optimized based on the data flow. And this works because we have some unused tags, some unused bits and bytes in the VLAN tag. When we configure a virtual LAN identifier for a network, the VLAN ID 10, 11, 12, 13, um, has an um, yeah, situation where inside this VLAN ID, we have some free um, yeah, digits for specifying the traffic class. So traffic class could be, for example, number five or number seven or number three. So the traffic class is only an identifier for specific workload. So let's use the tra traffic class number five. And we would say, okay, if a package with the traffic class identifier five comes, then please ensure that this package is always delivered and never dropped. And if you are not able to handle this package, then please inform the sender to reduce the speed. This is what Rocky does in easy words. The traffic class could also be in color. We would say maybe the green package is prioritized and the yellow one not or something like this. So this means for Rocky, we need a NIC that is Rocky capable. We discussed this. We need the cables, we need an IP address, but the VLAN is mandatory. You will never be able to configure a Rocky, a working Rocky configuration without VLANs when you use switches. And we need a Rocky capable switch because the switch needs the ability to watch into this package to analyze the traffic class and to say, okay, this package has to be prioritized or everything is fine. Uh, this is a not prioritized package. I can focus on other packages. For sure, also Rocky allows us to have a direct attached configuration. And then when we only have the sender and the receiver, we don't need um, yeah, the Rocky capable switch. So we can use only the IRIC cables. What is a Rocky capable switch? A Rocky capable switch has to support the standard IEE 802.1Q. This is the standard that ensures that the switch understands VLANs, virtual LAN IDs. If you check your switch, in 99% of cases, you will say, my switch supports VLANs nearly every every enterprise switch. I don't know any enterprise switch that does not support VLANs. But then you also need the 802.1QBB. And this is not Q, this is QBB. And this means priority flow control. And now I would say 90% of the switches I find in typical um, data center scenarios don't support the priority flow control. It's not a question of price or vendor. It's a question if the switch has this specific feature. They are relatively, yeah, cheap is the wrong word, cost optimized switches in the market that support priority flow control. 
but there are also um, high end enterprise switches that don't have this feature or they need the extension to have this feature. We also need the 8.2.1 QA set. This is the enhanced transmission selection ETS. And we need the um, yeah, um, LLDP um, protocol. It's 8.2.1 AB, not protocol, but specification. So these requirements are not there for IVORP. So if you have a switch that does not support these capabilities, you have two options. Replace the switch and you are able to use Rocky or keep the switch, then you should use iVORP because iVORP is in this point more flexible. Um, when you think about the performance, we often hear that iVORP has not the same capabilities than Rocky. But this is not true. I will show you um, um, yeah, performance graphics. And this information was provided by NVIDIA. This is important to know. So this is not a neutral test. This is provided by NVIDIA. You remember NVIDIA, they support the Rocky. And here we have a configuration with four hosts and with Rocky and important are not the absolute numbers. Let's use 100 gigabit interfaces, then we will see a bandwidth with 100 gigabits. Let's use four 100 gigabit interfaces, then you will see a bandwidth with 400 gigabits. The interesting thing is <clears throat> when we look at these graphics, we can see that Rocky is relatively stable, and what you have to know that on the top where we have this absolute accurate line here, we have um, no congestion. So this means we have available capacity in the switch. Here we have a situation with congestion. So you can see we have some ups and downs, but very small. These are only a few um, yeah, megabytes or maybe small gigabyte numbers we can see here. On the right hand side, we can see the IVORP configuration and we can see the bandwidth from maximum to minimum is much higher. But the difference is also that for IVORP, I don't need a specific switch. And if I, for example, plan with 20 gigabytes per second, both are equal. And what's also important to know, IWARP can also be configured with priority flow control and enhanced transmission selection. And if I configure PFC and ETS, for sure, I need a specific switch with IWARP. So at this point, I have the same requirements but if I configure my switch with the prior, sorry, my um, IVORP network interface card with the priority flow control, what's possible? I don't have to switch to Rocky. Then we will see the situation that the traffic is something like here, here. So don't look at the absolute numbers, but um, hear my explanation. The difference in Rocky and IVORP is there if I have a different configuration, if I configure, uh, if I compare different things, if I configure the a priority flow control on both technologies, they are on the same level if I have comparable network interface cards. So on both sides, for example, 100 gigabit port speed or something like this. So IVORP and Rocky are really on the same level regarding the capabilities. Um, IVORP is more flexible regarding the configuration, but if you don't configure the priority flow control and if you don't require a specific switch, then you will see something like this. 
this is not bad and this only happens if we have congestion so when our switches are at their um, yeah maximum load um, and we can optimize this in also configuring pfc there okay so what happens if you have several network interface cards um, in windows server in the previous versions we had something like lbfo the load balancing failover teaming lbfo is not any longer supported in azure stack hci it's available in windows server for backward compatibility in azure stack hci we have the switch embedded teaming the set switch has several advantages with lbfo load balancing failover teaming we had two components we had the physical NIC team, this was the first object we created, and we had the Hyper-V virtual switch that was connected to this LBFO team. So two layers, and you know, as more layers we have, it's more overhead we have, and um, for sure we also have um, yeah, possible misconfigurations. Also an important point is, that these virtual NIC ports for the VMs are not able to use the advantages of RDMA. So the physical NIC ports could be RDMA capable ports. The VMs couldn't use the advantages. With the set switch, with the switch embedded teaming, we have several, uh, several advantages. Advantage number one, we have only one object. The virtual switch includes the teaming for the physical NIC ports. The other advantage is we can provide the RDMA capabilities to our virtual machines. So Azure Stick HCI only supports the set switch or it's strongly recommended to use the set switch. So the, regarding the set switch, different configurations are possible. We can configure a um, single set switch for all the traffic and build virtual NICs for SMB traffic, for virtual machine traffic, for host traffic. So everything can be on the virtual layer. The combination, the teaming is on the host layer. We can start with two ports. The set switch can have eight, up to eight ports. Eight is the maximum in a set switch. The ports have to be absolutely identical. And for sure, this can be eight ports with uh, each port 100 gigabit port speed. So this means 800 gigabit or with the newer ports, um, yeah, eight times 200 gigabits or eight times 400 gigabytes but these are pre-release samples from network interface cards that are actually available for sure we can also use dedicated network interface cards for the um, smb traffic and this is what i would recommend to you because when a customer was running a traditional um, three-tier data center with sun systems then usually this customer had some um, yeah, dedicated storage adapters so adapters with iSCSI or fiber channel or sas connectivity when we have two or more dedicated nic ports for smb traffic then smb is for server message blocks the smb traffic smb3 um, is used in azure stack hci for transferring the data between the hosts and this dedicated network interface cards they don't need a teaming because there's a technology that's called smb multi-channeling and with the smb multi-channeling we can um, take the advantage to separate our storage traffic on the physical layer this is not required this is only a recommendation because it's easier it's typically it's easier for the customer to understand okay this is my storage cable and this is the rest and to say okay we have these two cables all the traffic goes across 
and we have the separation on the virtual layer here. So this is my recommended scenario. What does Microsoft officially recommend? One possible recommendation is to have a two node configuration. This would also be possible with three or four nodes where we have the RDMA traffic direct connected. It's only one of many scenarios. So we have the RDMA NIC2 and the RDMA NIC1, and they are directly connected. Additionally, for sure, we need some network interface cards for the VM traffic for the virtual machines. And these network interface cards can be connected to one top of the rack switch. For sure, this switch is my single point of failure, but this is an easy configuration that's part of the official documentation that's officially supported, especially for smaller environments where I need a high available and redundant workload and where I'm focused on optimized and reduced costs and where I can survive some outage on the network. Um, because if maybe this top of the rack switch fails, maybe I will replace this switch or restart the switch or do something, my workload on the cluster will keep up and running because the cluster is still there. The RDMA NICs don't communicate via this top of the rack switch, so we don't have a dependency here. Different official supported topology. And if you keep these topologies in mind, these are the official recommended topologies by Microsoft. Every other configuration, I will show you three or four of these um, recommended topologies, is not an official recommended topology. And so it's maybe supported, but it's not recommended. So this is recommended and supported. If you need redundancy on the network layer, for sure you can work with two top of the rack switches where your network interface cards for the VM traffic and the host management are connected. And for sure you have to connect them vice versa to ensure that if one switch fails, the communication still works. All those, the switches have to be connected to each other um, in this recommended and supported configuration, we still have the network interface cards for the RDMA traffic directly connected. It's possible, it's a cheap option, it's extensible by a switch in a later time, for sure we have to change something in the configuration, but this is possible to work directly connected. If you want to add switches, you could add the storage switches on the bottom of the screen in the same way we have the top of the rack switches here. So for full redundancy, we need two of them. Or in other words, it's better to have a direct connection scenario with two network interface cards than have to be to have a scenario where we have a storage switch and only one of them, because then this is the single point of failure for our storage traffic. Another configuration that's recommended and possible is to have something like a cluster we can see here, a four node cluster. Yeah, so, no, sorry, an eight node cluster. We have four nodes here and four nodes here. So here we have the situation. We have two NICs for management and compute. So compute is the virtual machines. And we have two network interface cards for RDMA traffic. So there's two network interface cards for RDMA traffic and the two network interface cards for um, the NIC uh, management and compute both are connected to both switches. So for the RDMA card one, we have the connection here. The RDMA card two, we have the connection here. RDMA card one here and RDMA card two here. And the same for teaming 
um, for management and compute. So each server has a connectivity to switch one and to switch two to ensure to have full redundancy even if a switch fails. For sure, this configuration is also possible with two and two nodes or with one and one node. Um, if this is a stretch cluster, we need minimum two nodes on each side. This is important for stretch clustering. Minimum two nodes on each side. So when we look at this configuration here, the difference is when we look at the diagram here, we have um, a configuration with our um, yeah, topology um, four. It's a fully converged network. So we only have two network interfaces for management, compute, and storage. This option number four is the configuration with the smallest amount of required physical NIC ports. We have the smallest amount of network cables because in this scenario, we only have um, yeah, four of them for each host. So if you have four hosts on each side, we have for sure 16 on each side. But on the other hand, with the configuration before, we have the double amount of network um, cables and network interface ports. But here we have the complexity in the software stack. So it's your choice if you prefer the physical cables. You say, I'm using this converged network where I have still dedicated storage ports, or if you prefer this fully converged configuration here. Okay, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask. The Azure Stack HCI switchless configuration is really great and powerful for two node configurations. It's also possible with three or four nodes. Here we can see the storage NICs are connected directly and the NICs for management and virtual machines, they are connected to the um, to a switch for sure because they have to be reachable from the rest of the network world here. So three node is possible, direct connected, four node, five node is possible, direct connected, but we have to connect every host to every other host. So the amount of required cables and ports increases. Um, yeah dramatically so i would use direct connected for two node configurations maybe for three node configurations specific cases maybe four node configurations as more hosts this will be as uh, easier is to use a switch because we can reduce the amount of required cables from the official Microsoft documentation, the direct connected scenario for three nodes, for example, looks like this. So every server is connected to every other server and you should have these um, connections redundant. And what's also important, because SMB1 will not be able to communicate with SMB2, and SMB2 will not be able to communicate with SMB3. This is the reason why we need one subnet for each color here, because the failover cluster validation with her wizard will check if the communication between these network interface ports is possible. And the failover cluster validation wizard does not know about the direct connectivity between the servers. And this is the reason this is explained in the uh, docs article here. Um, this is the reason why you have to ensure that every server needs in the direct connected scenario for each um, connectivity, his own subnet. So a few other topics about networking. Azure Stack HCI supports full micro segmentation when we configure software-defined networking. 
what is this for? In a traditional network configuration, we have a firewall that yeah, ensures that only allowed traffic can bypass from the internet to our local network. But if we have this traditional approach, we have the situation if some malware or unwanted software is in our network, maybe brought by a mobile device into our network, then the doors are open. So this is the reason why we usually talk about um, zero trust in the modern world. And zero trust is supported by micro segmentation in Azure Stack HCI. This means that the each data flow is only allowed on the specific network interface where this specific traffic type is really needed. So this means that we have an absolute granular segmentation here between the VMs and between the traffic types. And so if something goes wrong in the VM1, the other VMs are not impacted by this because of this micro segmentation. And this micro segmentation also extends to the rest of the traffic. So the management traffic, the storage traffic, and so on. When we talk about firewall, it's interesting to know which port does Azure Stack HCI need? Because Azure Stack HCI, if you attended the previous Tech Talks, you know Azure Stack HCI needs a connectivity to Azure. It's always Azure Arc enabled, Azure Stack HCI. So the latest version is Azure Stack HCI 22H2. The previous version was 21H2 and both versions are automatically Azure Arc enabled. This brings a lot of advantages. But to be able to Azure Arc enable the system, we need some internet connectivity. I mentioned Azure Stack HCI OS runs on premises in our environment. So, and here it's good to know that the Azure Stack HCI cluster only needs the well-known Azure IPs. So we don't have any specific IPs, only the well-known Azure IPs. So you will usually have this IPs allowed if you use hybrid services like Azure Active Directory and so on. Then we only have outbound direction. So you can see here, no incoming traffic for the Azure Stick HCI connectivity. Incoming traffic is possible if you have a hybrid configuration where you say, but I need some traffic from the cloud to on-premise, you can configure this. There are different options. You can configure a VPN connectivity. You can have a side-to-side -side VPN. You can use express route for connection. You can use the public ports. So there are many, many ways, but if you don't want this, for registering the Azure Stack HCI and for registering Azure Arc and using all these advantages, only outbound direction is there. And we only use port 443, HTTPS only. So only HTTPS connectivity for the outbound traffic. On the learn link below here, we have a detailed list with all these Azure um, well-known Azure URLs and IPs that will be connected by the Azure Stick HCI cluster. We have one list with the yeah, um, recommended links and one list with the required links. So if we open this here and I show you this learn article, then we will see here we have the URLs. Login, Microsoft, Graph, Management, and so on. Always port 443. So you can use this for whitelisting your firewall, for configuring your firewall in your environment. And then we have some additional recommended firewall URLs. They are not required, but they are recommended. For example, the PowerShell gallery, um, if you need some extensions for your environment. So this is one big advantage in Azure Stack HCI. It's really well documented regarding the network. 
And when we stay in the network, also software load balancer infrastructure is supported in combination with software defined networking. So, you know, and you have seen this on our first graphics of this tech talk today, the workload regarding the storage traffic is fully redundant. If we are running a virtual machine in this environment and a node fails, the virtual machine will be provided by another host. We will not have any data loss if everything is configured accordingly. We don't have an interruption in our storage traffic. Our VM has to be started again for sure because the host failed without any uh, yeah, information before. So it was an immediate outage of the host in our idea. So the VM has to be started on another host for sure. But with the software load balancer, we have the advantage that the network um, traffic is also distributed across the nodes. So with the software load balancer infrastructure, we have one advantage regarding the throughput in the network to have a distributed traffic regarding the network. And we have the advantage that if a workload moves, we have a continuous access of the resource. In an Azure Stack HCI cluster, you can use live migration to move a virtual machine from one host to the other host and to ensure that we have an uninterrupted um, configuration or communication. When you think about your interface to the cloud, I mentioned there are different connectivities possible. So this depends on your requirements. This can only be an internet connectivity via your router. This can be um, a VPN configuration with Azure. This can be an express route if you need a dedicated network. So several options are possible here. So as you can see, many, many great capabilities in the Azure Stack HCI networking stack. So today we had no questions in the chat. Usually we have some questions in the tech talk. If you have any questions, feel free to send them in via the chat. I will answer them regarding the Azure Stack HCI and the networking part. If you have any questions about other Microsoft products and technologies, feel free to um, join the Tech Talk Q&A tomorrow, where we have 60 minutes for your questions from the Microsoft field. So you can ask about licensing, about products, about technologies, about Windows Server, about Azure Stack HCI, about hybrid connectivity, about Windows Admin Center, whatever you want. So I'm looking forward to have you here tomorrow, same time we had today for the Tech Talk Q&A. And we have another Tech Talk. It's next week. It's about Azure Stick HCI security. Then we will talk about security workloads, Defender, Sentinel, Administration, um, secured core and things like this. And very, very important part in uh, Azure Stack HCI. It's next week, Monday, same time we had today. And this is then the last Tech Talk for this year. So looking forward to have you there. And if you did not work with Azure Stack HCI till today, my recommendation is to try it out because Azure Stack HCI in my opinion and also in the official explanation from Microsoft is the future for physical installations. So if you are thinking about how or which operating system to use on your physical environment, Azure Stack HCI will be more and more relevant because Azure Stack HCI includes all the new capabilities Microsoft offers for Hyper-V and Storage Spaces Direct. Azure Stick HCI is the best OS for the physical installation and Azure Stick HCI is optimized for this physical installation. Windows Server on the other hand, 
provides all the roles like remote desktop services, file services, domain controllers, for sure also Hyper-V and storage spaces direct in the data center edition and so on. Hyper-V is also in the standard edition, um, storage spaces direct only in the data center edition. Um, and Windows Server can be installed in both layers. It can be our physical host and it can be our virtual machine. But um, my recommendation is to use Azure Stack HCI for the host and Windows Server for the VM. So thank you very much for your time so far. Looking forward to have you here next Monday for the Tech Talk Azure Stack HCI Security and tomorrow for the Q&A. And for sure, you can also join if you don't have specific questions because you will take advantage um, from the questions that are asked from the community. And I will bring some topics with me if there are no questions in the chat. And here we have a German language feedback. Thanks uh, for the information and have a nice day. The same to you. Have a nice day. Thanks for your time and thanks for joining the Tech Talks. And looking forward to have you here tomorrow. Bye.